Far Side Security. Some of you may know me from my earlier work. I used to be in the DNS community and I am responsible for something called BIND. Um, I left the DNS field a few years ago to work on internet security. And um, of course, the first thing that I found was that there were a lot of things about internet security that were related to DNS. I'm going to tell you uh, a bit about that today. So first, let me explain something about DNS itself. Um, you really can't understand its role in security until you understand what it is intended to do when it's not doing security-related things. So there will be a tiny bit of uh, DNS technical information here, but really this is not intended to be a DNS technical tutorial, so uh, I will keep that part brief. Please come in, join us. There are many definitions of the Internet, um, and it depends on whether you're asking an uh, anthropologist or a politician or a technologist as to which answer you will get. For me, the best answer ever provided is the one shown here by Seth Breedbart, where he explained it in mathematical terms. Um, the reason this definition is good is that it is possible to create a network that speaks the Internet protocol but is not connected to the rest of the networks that speak the Internet protocol. Uh, since the Internet is a network of networks, uh, really it's a recursive definition. So what Seth tried to point out in this definition is that what we call the Internet is the largest portion of those networks which can exchange packets with each other. Um, and what's important about this definition, as far as DNS is concerned, is that the Internet is uh, described in terms of packet reachability. In other words, uh, while most of us may think of the Internet as whatever shows up on our smartphone, um, for, on an underlying basis, the Internet is made up of packets. And those packets each have addresses, and in order to uh, reach someone with a piece of content, you have to chop your content up into packet-sized pieces and uh, send them along to the addresses belonging to the recipients. Uh, so those IP addresses underlie everything. Uh, fundamentally, the Internet is all about packets with having addresses, so that's why we call IP, Internet Protocol. Now, we overlay that with a lot of things. I mentioned our smartphones are uh, really more part of the web than they are part of the Internet. In other words, most of what we see on our smartphones is uh, information that arrived over the HTTP protocol and contains text in the HTML language. Uh, but nevertheless, the Internet itself is much larger and much older than the web. Uh, and for me, the most important overlay is not the web, but rather DNS itself. So uh, when you do something, you send email, you receive it, you click on something in your web browser, you click on something on your, on your phone, um, what that's really doing is making a TCP IP session between you and somewhere and uh, speaking the TCP IP protocol in order to say what you want and uh, gather some sort of response. And before you can speak TCP IP to the other end, you will do a DNS lookup in order to find the address uh, where that connection should go. Um, in other words, while DNS is built using the Internet Protocol, it's also, practically speaking, the case that TCP IP depends on DNS as well as the TCP IP Protocol. So um, you may think, since you're not typing in so many domain names now, uh, you know, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, it was often necessary to type www.somethingexample.ru into a web browser in order to see content. We're not doing that. For the most part, we're using search or we're clicking on something. Uh, that does not mean that the DNS has become smaller or less relevant. Uh, it means that the user interface has improved and we are now not looking at the DNS as much as we used to, but it is actually larger and more important 
now than it was when it was more visible. Uh, everything you can reach in search is only reachable because it has a domain name. Uh, all web links connect uh, from one web page to another using a URL that has in it a domain name and so forth. Um, so it's important that we remember as we contemplate the security implications of DNS and some of the uh, security applications of DNS that uh, it underlies everything. And the internet is only reachable because we have a map and that map is made of DNS. Now DNS has a rigorous internal structure. Uh, it only works if you get it right. Approximation will do you no good. Uh, with the DNS, you have to, uh, you can't transpose two digits of a number or two letters of a name. It has to be entirely correct or whatever content you're trying to reach or whatever content you're trying to put online will not be reachable. And this is different from who is. Uh, a lot of us have been asked when we register a domain name or acquire a, a block of IP address spaces to provide information for the WHOIS protocol. Generally, if you intend criminal use of a domain name or an IP address block, the last thing you want is for your victims to know your home address and phone number and know where to send the police or know how to target a uh, lawsuit or other complaint against you. And so who is is normally wrong uh, for criminal assets. Who is is almost always either hidden or um, uh, corrupt. So um, you can have privacy in who is, but you cannot have privacy in the DNS. As I mentioned, if DNS is wrong, your content won't be reachable. It would be great, I think, if we had been able to move from the uh, industrial age into the information age and create the internet and make the internet into the world's communications and economics uh, backbone. Uh, if we had somehow been able to do that and have only uh, good people, friendly, law-abiding people uh, join us, but that didn't happen, that never happens. The uh, criminal element is part of humanity and they will come with us wherever we go. Um, so we did not create an internet that was just for good purposes. Excuse me. Um, but that's not all bad because online crime, like everything else you might want to do on the internet, uh, is only possible because of DNS. Uh, now we're seeing some implications of that, such as uh, cheap throwaway domain names that are crafted for a single attack, for a single attacker against a single victim in some cases, and then thrown away immediately afterward. Um, and I'll talk a little more about that. But we also see certain DNS registrars, ISPs, uh, name servers, that are more or less dedicated to the criminal purposes. Um, and th that creates the equivalent in the internet uh, territory of bad neighborhoods and we can map those bad neighborhoods as well. Um, now, Francis Bacon wrote that nature to be commanded must be obeyed, and um, we're very fortunate that DNS is part of nature in that regard. Uh, you, you have to follow its rules uh, or it will not do what you want. Now, I mentioned that there would be a small DNS technical tutorial. This is it, it all fits on one slide, so if you'll just bear with me for a minute. I want to explain that domain names are grouped into zones. Um, some domain names are, uh, look very close to other domain names. Example.ru, for example, uh, is a zone, and it, uh, it is part of the RU zone, which is itself part of the, uh, the, the root zone. And generally, when you're transferring DNS content around, you're doing it by zones. And it's also possible when you're looking at any given name to know which zone that name is part of. And once you know that, then it uh, becomes relevant that every zone has some name servers. In other words, the zone cannot be reached unless there is some server reachable through the internet that will tell you what's in that zone. Um, now those name servers, each has an address or some, one or more addresses I've used V4 addresses here, but V6 addresses are becoming more common. Um, and uh, you don't have to be a name server to have an address, of course. The web server for apnic.net 
has an address and it is not used for DNS. Um, so DNS doesn't really care what has an address. It just notes that name servers have to have addresses in order for DNS itself to work. And finally, those addresses are grouped together into net blocks. And I've shown here a net block ending in slash 24. That is 256 adjacent IP addresses. And once you know an IP address, you can find out what net block it is in. And that becomes important if you want to know what else is in the same net block. I also showed a slash 28 network. That is 16 adjacent IP addresses. IPv4, of course, uh, ran out a couple of years ago. And uh, we are running on fumes, which means that we're carving up the address space into smaller and smaller net blocks in order to recover the space that was wasted earlier in the Internet's development. Uh, but anyway, this is what you need to know to understand the uh, security implications and applications of DNS. Um, I'm going to refer to some of these concepts later. So it would not be fair to talk about DNS and security without talking about DNS security. Um, so very briefly, let me tell you that DNS can be made more secure. You could, for example, if you're doing zone transfers between yourself and some registrar or maybe somebody who's doing secondary name service for you, uh, that you could use transaction signatures in order to have the, uh, you know, one name server will validate the identity of another based on a shared secret called TSIG. Um, you can also control the updates to a zone using TSIG. Uh, DNSSEC, on the other hand, is a larger system, much larger than TSIG, uh, that allows a zone to be signed. And that would mean that no matter what server is emitting content for a zone, it would be emitting that content with signatures that are generated using keys, and the keys themselves can be fetched using the DNS. And that means that when you receive some data, uh, when you do a DNS query, for example, uh, you would receive the signatures and you could look up the keys and you could decide using uh, crypto authenticity whether the content you're reading was generated by the owner of that zone or not. Uh, this is important because traditionally DNS has been completely unsecure, meaning that any man in the middle can insert any data they want or remove or modify any existing data that they might want to do. And a querier would have no way to know that that's happened. Um, so DNSSEC could be very important. Unfortunately, DNSSEC has taken 18 years of development um, and six years of deployment and is really not very well deployed. So uh, we could look at the history of DNSSEC and guess that perhaps it will never be well deployed. Nevertheless, it's a great idea, and there are some applications which behave differently in the, in the presence of authentic data. So uh, I'm, I'm, I encourage you to investigate it if you have not, just as you should investigate TSIG if you didn't know about it. Um, but our topic is different. I'm not telling you how to secure DNS. Today I'm telling you that just as there are attack vectors, there are also defense vectors and DNS can be an important defense vector when you're trying to protect your assets. Excuse me. <laughs> so here, briefly, is the flow of data through the DNS system. Uh, the things on the bottom are this laptop or your smartphones or pretty much any server in any colo facility. Uh, they are stub resolvers, and they are making queries in order to do their work. They make those queries of what's called a recursive name server. Um, that recursive name server remembers everything that it has been asked, at least everything recently that it's been asked, so that if several different stub resolvers want the same thing, it's able to provide the second answer very quickly. It comes out of cache. Now, the data path between those bottom two bubbles has PII, personally identifiable information. Um, and in Russia, as in many other parts of the world, uh, the handling of PII is a subject of national law. You have to be careful with this stuff. We don't necessarily want it to be that someone, just because they happen to use your uh, recursive name server, ends up getting spammed and so forth. So uh, we really have to protect that bottom link. 
Now, if the recursive server has asked something that it doesn't know, it's not in that cache, it will go fetch it from the authority servers. And I've already described the authority servers. Those are the things that contain zones. And they have addresses and names and so forth. So this really is it. This is uh, the entire DNS data flow uh, on one slide. DNS is only fast because it is simple. So now that I've talked about DNS as it is, let me talk about DNS as it is abused. Pay no attention to these men but man behind me. This is a picture of a spoofed source DDoS attack. Uh, what we have here is that the attacker in the top bubble is transmitting a, small, a, a series of very small packets. These packets are DNS requests, and they are reaching that reflector at the bottom. However, the attacker has crafted the packet very carefully. The, uh, re the requests that are seen by that reflector at the bottom appear to have come from the target on your left. And so the answers, which are much larger than the requests, are then transmitted toward the apparent source of the queries, which is that target on the left. Uh, this is incredibly damaging. It is very difficult for anyone uh, other than perhaps Google or Facebook or uh, Cloudflare or Akamai to accept an unlimited amount of this type of uh, third-party traffic and remain online. Um, this is, every time you read in the newspaper that there has been another 400 gigabit per second attack against Spam House or someone else, it was this. Uh, this is what makes it possible. You have DNS to thank, but you also have that spoofing to thank. Right? We would love it if that attacker in the top bubble was prevented from using an IP address other than the ones allocated to it by their ISP. Um, unfortunately, the internet developed uh, scientifically first. It was mostly used by government contractors and uh, research facilities and so forth uh, in its early days. And while the destination pa address on an IP packet matters a lot, in other words, if you don't have the right destination, it won't get where you want it to go, and so you, you have a strong incentive to set the right destination address. The source address doesn't matter at all. It can be literally anything coming from most of the Internet. It is almost, uh, it's almost unheard of for an ISP to practice what, what I call source address validation, SAV. And the reason for that is that it will not benefit them in any way. If you prevent, if you're an ISP or a university or a company and you pre prevent forged packets from leaving your network, the only beneficiary will be everyone else's network. In other words, it won't help you at all. It'll help your competitors quite a bit. And that is not a strong value proposition for an executive team when they're uh, asking for, for, for budget. Um, so, we can't really fix the edge of the internet so that the spoofing stops. And what we've done instead is to learn how to be a better reflector. I mentioned that that box on the bottom is a reflector. Uh, and by the time a packet has gone through the internet and come out the other side, it can legitimately have come from anywhere. You really don't know as that reflector that the packet didn't come from the target. However, DNS data has a certain property you won't ask the same question over and over again because you have a cache. And so by looking at the implications of that cache, we were able to guess pretty effectively uh, in the reflector, which is an authoritative name server, we were able to guess pretty effectively uh, which packets were part of a DDoS just because some of them should not be repeating as often as they are. Um, so the, the way this works is, because you yourself might be the target of a DDoS, uh, you can only be uh, sort of assured that your, your DNS content will remain online in the face of a DDoS if you massively over-provision your servers. And that means that your name server is an ideal DDoS reflector. Uh, just because of what you had to build for a different reason, you become the ideal reflector for other people's attacks against third parties. Um, but we developed this uh, response rate limiting logic, which first went into bind because that was where I worked at the time, uh, but it has since been implemented in NSD, 
from NLNet Labs and also not in, uh, from the CZ.NIC Labs. And uh, it's pretty effective, as I'll show you in a moment. Um, and I just want to mention that if you're running an authority server and you have not turned this on, uh, please reconsider. Please go investigate this. Find the configuration knobs that you have to turn and turn it on. Um, I'll give you an example of why you might want to do that. Uh, Affilius runs the uh, .info domain, which is one of the first generations of new GTLDs. It was created about 10 years ago. It's not particularly popular because everybody likes .com. Um, nevertheless, they get a lot of, uh, they have a lot of uh, registrations, they get a lot of traffic, and Affilius runs the authority servers for .info. Now in this graph, what you'll see above the zero point um, up here is query traffic. And you can see that it is peaking at about two gigabits per second of query traffic. And you can see that the response is um, relatively smaller, but, uh, oh, excuse me, I've got that backward. That's the response. This is the query volume. These are the queries coming in about 100 megabits a second. Here it boosts to about 250 megabits a second. This is, this is the response packets. I apologize, I'm jet lagged. I got this wrong. Now, you can see, even see the outage. It's kind of interesting. They had a period during which they received no traffic. Uh, that's really unusual. The traffic for DNS never stops, but they also sent no responses during that period, so uh, probably the problem was upstream of them. Anyway, they were getting phone calls. They were getting complaints from various DDoS victims around the internet saying, could you please stop sending me all of these responses? And what they said, this is traditional, this is what you say if somebody asks you to stop DDoSing them, is, well, okay, I'm answering the queries I'm getting. And if you wish, I will arrange to answer no queries that appear to come from you. Is that what you want? And what that would mean is that .info would disappear for you. You would not be able to get any answers at all. And so what you then say is, well, no, I don't want you to black hole me. You know, I don't want you to filter all my traffic. I just want you to please stop answering traffic that didn't come from me. And as I mentioned before, by the time a packet goes through the internet core, it can legitimately have come from anywhere. So there was nothing they could do until we released the DNS response rate limiting patches and they installed those. And you can see on Thursday of this week what happened, which is that the queries continued, but the response traffic shrank to less than 100 megabits per second. Because even though the DDoSes were still continuing, in other words, the forged request packets were still coming in, the name server had gained the ability to guess which of those requests was part of a DDoS and which part was not. Now, .info may not seem very important. Uh, as I said, it isn't nearly as popular as .com, but it is a utility. There are a lot of, uh, a lot of companies around the world who use .info, and uh, so it would have been damaging for Affilius if they had installed this logic and if people had started to complain and to say, hey, my domain is offline. Affilius, what are you doing to me? But they got zero complaints about this. They installed the patches. They stopped sending gigabits of outbound traffic. They stopped getting complaints from people getting DDoSed, and they got no complaints from anyone else. So this was a pure win for, for them. It would be a pure win for any of you to also install DNS response rate limiting on your name servers. It's probably in whatever name server you're running. It's free. It's unencumbered. Uh, there's no downside. So. Let's talk about domain names. Um, originally, when Atomic Power was first uh, presented, uh, first proposed in the United States, uh, it was said that we would be able to generate electricity using uh, atomic reactions, and that the result would be that electricity would be so plentiful that the cost of metering it would be the dominant, uh, dominant cost, and that if it's too cheap to meter, you might as well just give it away. Now, that didn't happen. It turns out atomic power is a little more expensive than they said, but uh, it's not the first time that marketing has been ahead of the game, um, too far ahead of the game. But I will say that that phrase, too cheap to meter, does apply to domain names. Um, and we did that. We, the security community, have forced the cost of domain names down. Um, 
And we did it with the best of intentions, and we did it step by step, we did it inevitably. Um, so I'll give you an example. When Spam Assassin, which is an open source spam filtering tool, was first released, um, it had a number of built-in heuristics by which it would look at inbound email and say, well, that doesn't look right, so I'm going to score that, e that email message as spammy. And if you add enough things to the score, then it would reject the inbound mail. And this was seen as, uh, strangely, this was seen as a great uh, step forward because it meant that the spammers would no longer be able to reach us and that uh, we could go on about our days. Now, um, what we have learned since then and what some of us knew at that time is that spammers are adaptive and they are never going to reach the point where they say, oh, you've made it too hard for me to spam. I guess I will stop spamming and go get a job. That's not going to happen. Uh, what happened instead is that um, we were using a heuristic in Spam Assassin where a raw IP address, a so-called dotted quad, would be used as, sign, as a sign that this email is probably spam. And all this meant was that uh, spammers were having a hard time getting domain names, and so they were saying HTTP colon slash slash, then a bunch of numbers instead of a domain name. And we used that as an indication that inbound mail was spam, and so the spammers stopped using it. They put pressure on other parts of the DNS uh, ecosystem in order to make domain names cheaper so that they could use domain names in their email again because they knew that we would be watching for dotted quads. Now, as a, I was a terrible parent, and any of my children will tell you this, and one of the reasons is that as my children grew up and did some predictably crazy, stupid things that all of us did as children, I, I asked them many times, uh, what did you think was going to happen? And this is what I would ask the developers of Spam Assassin. What did you think was going to happen? If you make it that easy for spammers to bypass you, what's going to be the next step? You should always be playing the, the game a couple of moves ahead. Um, don't take the easy way forward. So. Um, Anyway, the part of the result of this was the EPP protocol. First we had RRP, then EPP. And this was meant to try to grow the DNS so that .com would not be the only possible place to register things. And so now we have a whole bunch of registries and registrars, we've got registrants, we've got ICANN there trying to regulate the whole thing. Um, and this created what I call a race to the bottom which is whoever can create these domains faster and cheaper will have a larger share of the market because we've made the market fluid enough that you can pick who your suppliers will be. Uh, so inevitably, whoever, uh, the, the, the losers were the ones who didn't adapt. And what they had to adapt to was a tremendous demand for new domains, what I call junk domains. Now, um, it's worth mentioning that there was a time when to get a new .com, .net, or .org domain, uh, you would put in your request, and on the following Tuesday or Friday, your request would be answered. It might take up to three or four business days for you to um, get your domain registered. And frankly, I think that was a pretty good system. I think uh, domain names that took that long to register were a little bit more valuable than the ones we have today. But inevitably, um, somebody came along and said, well, I want to sell domains, and uh, I, don't have, <coughs> I don't have an attractive suffix. I'm selling .info, I'm selling .biz, I'm selling something that isn't .com, uh, which in the United States means that nobody wants to buy it. And so the question was, how can I make my product more attractive? And they finally said, oh, well, if VeriSign is only doing domain releases twice a week, we'll do them every day, and that will make us more competitive. Now, VeriSign did not take that line down. VeriSign said, well, if you can do it every day, uh, we don't like that. We, we want to remain the, the premier thing. We want .com to win. So we're going to do it every hour. And then the other guys said, oh, if you can do it every hour, we can do it every five minutes, and so forth and so forth, until we got down to the speed of light. You really can't do it in less than 30 seconds and have it be globally reachable. Now, uh, what this predicts is that if we get faster than light networking, some sort of quantum entanglement-based networking, one of the first uses it will be put to is to reduce this 30-second delay that domains have before, between when you want them and when you get them. 
uh, because clearly that is uh, adding value for somebody, but it's subtracting value to the rest of us. I really think that uh, domains that can only be created after three or four days would be better for me uh, as a receiver of spam, for example, or as a receiver of phishing attacks. Um, alas, I was not asked. So uh, we can't prevent it. There's no way to prevent new domain names from being created. Um, so there are some other far end tactics we can do after they've been created. Uh, for example, there are many security companies, probably some represented in this room, who will sell the service of takedown. You can call them and say, my brand name is being abused, and here's the domain name, and uh, can you work on taking that down? And they will. And the registries and registrars of the world have now got entire departments of people with their own ticket queues, their own phone numbers that you can call to complain, either that there is uh, criminal infringement of some kind against your brand or your copyright or maybe it's hate speech or uh, child pornography, whatever it is, um, these companies are now accustomed to being asked to take things down and there are specialists who will help an enterprise get things taken down faster. Uh, .tk took this a step further. They have a special API that they allow security companies to use to take things down without any kind of consultation um, and the reason for this is that .tk is used primarily as a URL shortener for spammers. It's a lot, a lot like bit.ly. And um, so all of the domains created in .tk are crap. Um, and the assumption by the TK registry operator is that if we make it very easy for the security industry to take these names down, that will create demand for new, do new domains under .tk that will replace those. Uh, so I, I think of this as um, whack-a-mole as a service. Um, but we already know from the spam assassin example I gave earlier that if, if what you do in your recourse, in your response to, uh, to defend yourself is incremental, and it provides a clear path for the bad guy to take the next step in evolution to become a better bad guy, that's what they're going to do. Um, I much prefer alternatives that are uh, more final. That's why I, I have often said that when you're chasing a botnet, it is bad to take out the command and control node and call, it, uh, call that a good day's work. It is much better to leave the botnet in place until you can arrest and prosecute and incarcerate the people who built the botnet. Um, because otherwise, all you do is teach them how to hide better the next day, and they will be back the next day. So this is me asking us to please take fewer incremental uh, half steps in our defense. Anyway, those as far end tactics are useless. Uh, I hate them because all they do is um, extend this, uh, this endless combat. And um, I'm, I would like to find a way to give us a little bit more advantage. So I've developed some near-end tactics. So um, if we have to fight them on our doorstep instead of fighting them at the far end when they're, where they're being created or get them taken down quickly, uh, then we have to look at what we can do on our networks. Uh, now traditionally, the way we protect our networks is with a firewall, and you, we filter things out based on which IP addresses, which port numbers, in fact, some, sometimes based on URL. You might have a firewall that blocks things based on URL patterns. Um, and I developed one called RPZ, which is a DNS level firewall. I'll describe that in a moment. Uh, but first I want to say that the uh, modern firewall does not get programmed the way they did in uh, 1988. It used to be that you would log in with uh, Telnet or SSH or something like that to a router, speak to its uh, command line interpreter, and type some commands to add new rules to say, I want to block traffic from here, I want to allow traffic from there, something like that. Uh, that does not scale, uh, partly because you probably have more than one firewall and they all have to be configured together and partly because the churn rate at which you are adding new rules or expiring now defunct rules is much higher than a human can realistically do. And so we now have a published sub subscribe model for firewalls. Even in the traditional IP-based firewalls are able to treat all of the firewalls as a unit and have them subscribe to policy that comes from various places. 
And so that was the model that we followed with RPZ. Um, so briefly, RPZ puts the firewall policy into a zone file. Um, this, is, this makes the zone file very ugly. Um, and it, is, it makes your firewall configuration hard to read. So it was certainly not done for artistic reasons. But a lot of name servers are in a uh, very well-protected network. And we decided that since zone transfer is something that most of them were already allowed to do, that if we could put the firewall rules into the format of a zone, then the uh, firewall rules would be reachable. Um, and this is, uh, this is meant as an open standard. It's not encumbered, it's not patented, it's not copyrighted. There is no protection around it. Uh, we intended to make an open market with many producers, many security companies producing firewall rules in this format, and many consumers around the world who would subscribe to those. Some of them are free, some of them are, are not free. Um, but really, the, the format is the important part from my point of view. Um, and a given name server is capable of subscribing to several different policy feeds. So if you have several different free and several different uh, commercial firewall feeds that you want to subscribe a, a set of name servers to, that's, that's easily done. Um, and you can create one of your own and maintain your own firewall rules in your network, uh, network operations center uh, so that as you become aware of things that should not be resolved by your customers, uh, you can maintain those locally. So, um, you know, what you do when you filter it is up to you. I prefer to make things look like they don't exist, but a lot of companies can't afford the risk of that, so they use a, a firewall policy that forces their customers into what's called a walled garden, a special web page that warns the customer of, of what's been done, and that's, uh, that's also available. I'm not going to go into all the details except to say, any given firewall policy is going to have a bunch of different ways to trigger a rule and then a bunch of actions you can take if that trigger occurs. And uh, RPZ has everything that we thought of. Uh, it will gradually add a few more things, but uh, it certainly has everything that you would need to, uh, to, to explore this. And if you have ideas for other things you'd like to see, please contact us. We will extend the language. Um, so you might use this to block uh, DGA botnets like Conficker, because the command and control names are computable. You can know what they are. Uh, you can also block by name server name. So if you don't know what the domain name is, but you know what name server it's going to use, you can block it you know, before it is created. Um, you can also block things based on the d destination address. So it doesn't have to be the name server or the name. It could actually be the result. So uh, this is pretty cool because the spam house team has a do not route or appear list, which is a set of slash 18s, most of which are ripe slash 18s that were given to LIRs who turned out to be VPN providers for criminals. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, if you pull one of these things in, you can put it into this format and just say, I don't wish to resolve any domain name from any name server if the result would be an address inside this net block. Um, so, very powerful. Um, so, again, this is uh, completely open. The code that we put into bind is free. Uh, Unbound has it now indirectly. PowerDNS has a subset of this. Uh, it is likely that you are running one of those three name servers for your recursive service, which means that you already have this capability. You might not have known about it until you came here today. Uh, it will cost you a tiny fraction of your performance. Uh, if you were uh, burning 95% of your CPU answering DNS, then adding RPZ will reluctantly take that last 5%. Uh, but if you're burning 20% of your CPU doing DNS response, then it will change it to 21%. We're really only going to add it a 5% hit in order to do all of this policy logic. So performance was very much thought of. Um, and I want to mention RPZ is not an IETF standard. Uh, the IETF is um, a mature organization. It's a mature standards organization, which means that many of the people who are funded, their travel is paid to go to an IETF meeting, are sent not to 
uh, help standardize new good engineering, but rather prevent competitors from stan standardizing good new engineering because that might threaten the company. So there's a lot of defensive work going on in the IETF. And that in turn means that this particular feature, had I presented it in, roughly speaking, 2009 when we thought of it, uh, we would not be done writing the problem statement draft. And uh, I wanted it sooner than that. So this is not something the IETF has approved. Uh, I will eventually seek standardization after there is a global user base that is too large to ignore, because otherwise the IETF would uh, probably want to change everything. So I'm, I may seem a little bit uh, bitter about IETF. Uh, it's done some good things. I used to go to meetings. I don't anymore. Um, uh, but just the, the, the point of it is, this isn't an, there's no RFC for this. Uh, this is very much an inter-vendor standard that is outside the standards process. Okay. How are we doing on time? Doing well. All right. So in addition to stopping DDoS and firewalling bad content, uh, the other thing that I think is important about DNS that was not really well covered um, in the original implementation, either of Bind, which I did, or any other name server, is uh, query logging and response logging and trying to figure out sort of what your name server is doing. Uh, generally, you can see that it's working, and you know it's working because no one's complaining, uh, but you don't necessarily have good uh, record keeping. Uh, that just wasn't a strong consideration. But for security reasons, you really can't know how secure you are if you're not uh, paying attention to your logs. So here's that same picture again, showing the stub resolvers on the bottom with the PII and the cache and everything. And what you'll see here is that there is a uh, passive DNS sensor that is watching the packets that go upstream from the recursive. Um, I want to note that it's very deliberate on our part that uh, there's no PII where we collect the data. Uh, we're, we don't want to use this for surveillance. We, we, what we want to do is collect information about what the DNS contains, not who's accessing it. Um, so this is something that I do, and I do it sometimes commercially and sometimes not. If you are uh, either a researcher, a non-commercial researcher, a grad student, that kind of thing, or if you're an internet superhero trying to stop crime uh, from your house after you finish your day job, if, in other words, your use of our services would not be compensated in any way, you don't charge a fee for it, you don't get paid for it, and so forth, it's free. So um, commercial use, of course, is not free, but uh, please view this through the lens of not as a product pitch, but my explanation of how one approach to observing DNS. So we collect it and we, put it, we uh, make it available in real time to various analysts, and we also have a database. It is that database that I'm going to demonstrate here. So the traditional DNS lookup involves providing a name and a type and asking DNS what records correspond to that name and type. So I've done that here, except here I'm inquiring of a database. So you're seeing the history, not just what's true now, but what has been true at other times. And so you're able to guess from this that at a certain point, I put vix.com up for sale. That was my vanity domain. Um, eventually, it, I did finally sell it and uh, bought myself a new car. But um, that's not what's important right now. What's important is that you, as a security analyst trying to do recourse against VIX.com, assuming that it had attacked you, would know that I had changed the general purpose of this domain, or perhaps changed what ISP it was connected to, uh, somewhere between October and May of 2013. Um, and that could be very interesting. Uh, for if the change of the delta shown in this history uh, indicated that I had changed providers, then you as a defender might want to get in touch with my old provider to find out if I was thrown off due to complaints, uh, or even to find out if they still have records about uh, the billing address I had used so that you could target a lawsuit to the same address. Um, so this is just a, a history function. Um, here we show wildcarding. 
Now, wildcarding is built into the DNS protocol, but it's normally done by the server, and in this case, we're doing it uh, passively. So um, what I've asked for here is all of the subdomains of VIX.com that had a, a records, and I have limited it to just the addresses from my Comcast business connection because otherwise it wouldn't fit on, on this slide. Um, because I worked on Bind for many years, there's a huge amount of junk in VIX.com that uh, is not operationally meaningful. In any case, this is an inventory of uh, all the names I have exposed. And that's interesting. Again, if I was a criminal and you were trying to chase me down, you might be very interested in knowing what related names I have also created in addition to whichever one I used to attack you. Um, in this example, I'm doing a right-hand side lookup. In other words, I'm, not, I'm no longer looking at the name and finding out what types go with it. Here, I'm looking at the records and saying which names have ever resulted in, 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 this, in this case, MX. Um, and this is very interesting. This is my first time giving this talk in a former Soviet Union country. Uh, but I did, in fact, move from VIX.com to VIX.SU. Um, so thank you all for giving up the SU name to people like me. Um, anyway, so here I was looking for all of the names that used a certain MX value, which is a mail exchanger value. Um, and there's even a configuration management aspect to this because, in fact, I own a lot of vanity domains and I have sometimes forgotten which ones I own. And this is a way to find out which ones I need to make sure that I handle the mail for correctly. So that's a non-security use for it. But you could imagine that if I was a criminal, then knowing all of the other names I had routed the mail for uh, would be interesting to you. Um, I have some friends inside the FBI, and I wanted to congratulate them on how clean their network was. Um, in the six-year history of my database, they had never changed any of these values, and I thought, that's pretty nice. Uh, you know, most people have got a lot more junk in their domains, they've got a lot of churn and so forth. Um, but before I could congratulate them to the, how clean their network was, I thought I'd better look at the rest of it. And this is a right-hand side lookup that's based on the net block. So here I'm saying I want to know all of the names that have had an address in that slash 24. And um, here's where the junk came out, because this is exposing a number of things that perhaps the FBI would not like to be publicly associated with. But if you put it in the same slash 24, you're publicly associated with it. So um, again, if the FBI was a criminal organization, which I realize it must seem to some, um, then this would be a way of finding out uh, either who else that ISP has sold services to that are you know, very close by the one that attacked you, or if it's an actual network owner, you might just want to know what other businesses they're in because they likely have had to create a lot of A records in the, in the DNS that would have addresses nearby the one that you know about. So please have no fear. I've been showing you output in what I call dig format because that's what I like. I'm a DNS guy at heart, uh, but that is not the way the system works internally. So if you wanted to write code that used this service or any of the other services that uh, use the same API, you'd be speaking the JSON protocol, which is shown below. Um, so all the, the dig style output that I've been showing you was produced by the tool, not by the service. Um, so in, in this example, I've turned it off just to show you what the JSON schema looks like. Okay, so we are not the only DNS provider. Uh, there are many passive DNS projects around the world. It's one run by the Austrians. Uh, there's one at 360 Networks in China. Um, so they all speak the same protocol because we, uh, we created it first and then we made an IETF internet draft out of it, which means that if you write a tool that works with any of these services, it will work with all the others. Um, that internet draft is on its way to becoming an RFC someday. Um, our sensor is open source. Uh, we do that so that people who are sharing data with us can examine the source code and make sure that there are no back doors. Uh, but we also know that a number of other projects have adapted our sensor and are using it to collect data, 
uh, perhaps locally for some company related purpose or perhaps to create another passive DNS system and that's all fine by us. Uh, open source is what got the internet where it is today. We're not going to stop that now. Um, and I mentioned that if your purpose in using this does not generate any income for you, you're not paid to, to do the work, you charge no fee for your result, then please contact me and this will be free. Uh, we're really trying to make the internet safer and uh, we would get nowhere by only making this available commercially. So here is a couple of URLs. I've provided a copy of these slides to the organizer so you'll get uh, all of them including this. You need not take notes now. But uh, here are all the various public websites that describe the technologies that I've touched on today. And I see that we have uh, about nine minutes left which I'd love to use for questions. Hello, thanks for your talk. If you, if you could change, um, redesign the internet from scratch, what would you change? I would have added another layer to UDP, which would be a lightweight session protocol. Um, and I would have had the rule of thumb be that uh, the router upstream of you would not allow through random UDP packets that were not part of a session. Um, and uh, I think I would also have had longer addresses so that we didn't have an IPv6 transition to go through. Thanks. Lemon Alexander, Curator Labs, a uh, couple of notices. First of all, yes, a lot of people blame DNS for DDoS attacks. In fact, it's not a D DNS only, as you said, it's most of UDP-based protocols and the way we design it. Yes, UDP is a standard. We're giving it the way it is, but if any of you design your UDP-based protocol, please, please do not make an answers to unauthenticated AP address larger than a uh, request. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander, but I want to go a little further on both points. So um, DNS is the only thing that uses UDP uh, that is not land-based. I mean, I realize that NTP is also not land-based, but it could be. Uh, DNS has to be global, and uh, there's no way to make DNS fast enough using TCP. And so um, while any UDP protocol should have a session, uh, session layer in order to prevent this type of thing. Uh, the fact is DNS should have had it more than any other. And DNS is the most popular uh, and most abused UDP protocol. Um, I'd also like to say that um, if you, well, that's, that's enough on that. Okay, other questions? Hey. What do you think about DNSSEC? I think that DNSSEC um, is, I, I, as I mentioned during my talk, it, it, we've been working on it for 18 years now, and we've been trying to deploy it for the last six years, and it is still not deployed. And in fact, the current development in DNSSEC is quite instructive. Um, the Comcast team is leading the development of what they call, um, I forget what they call it, but it's a, it's a way to disable DNS resolution, DNSSEC, for certain parts of the namespace. And the reason they did that, uh, the reason they're leading the development of that RFC is because they turned on DNSSEC validation as one of the largest uh, carriers, largest eyeball carriers in the United States. Uh, and they were, you know, years ahead of anybody else, and that was great, until one day NASA was trying to put a rocket somewhere, and there was an, a, a live stream of that rocket going somewhere, and Comcast users could not see the live stream. And I have to say, NASA is hugely popular in the United States. I don't know about you guys, but when there's something live streamed by NASA, there's a lot of people watching it in the U.S., and nobody from Comcast could reach it, and the reason is that NASA had messed up their DNS keying information. In other words, they were putting out the right address, but the wrong signatures. 
and the incorrect signatures caused Comcast to then refuse to uh, resolve those names to those addresses. And so Comcast wisely asked the question, all right, we now know the cost. We can miss a NASA launch and get 100,000 angry people calling us. That's the cost. What's the benefit? Well, the benefit is that an attack that has never occurred would not work here. Hmm, okay. So they didn't turn off the NSIC validation. Instead, they came up with a publish subscribe mechanism for turning off DNSSEC validation anytime they knew that a certain domain would, be, uh, would have incorrect keying information. In other words, they are adding moving parts to a 25 million user network in order to deal with the fact that the primary impact of DNSSEC on them so far is that their network becomes less reliable because of other people's key management problems. So I really think that Economically speaking, this is a problem in search of a solution. And I expect that it's going to go on being so until somebody somewhere comes up with something that is a cheaper or uh, at least less dangerous way to provide the same value. Um, so I'm not sure where the outcome is, but I can tell you the outcome is in doubt. Nobody knows whether DNSSEC is going to be fully deployed or abandoned before, uh, before that can happen. Alexander. One more question. You mentioned this 18 years. Uh, don't you think it's a little bit too much for one protocol extension? And then uh, do you think such long-term technical developments, is it really viable in uh, commercial space where you have to have this new technology, new protocol next year? 18 years is a little bit more like a human lifetime to me. So, yes, 18 years is a crazy long period of time. Um, we did the original NCP for the ARPANET in 18 months, and we did TCP IP in nine months. And um, uh, we put a man on the moon in only nine years. And so uh, this is crazy. Nobody can do any sort of business planning or decide how to make their investments or how to design their products if their product depends on this, if they think that something like this could take as long as it has and still be uncertain. So yes, 18 years means it has, by some measure, already failed. Can you somehow, do you think there is a room for improvement? Can, can we change something? Well, that's what's happened, actually. Um, every two years, somebody comes along and says, you know, DNSSEC would be much better if we would start over. And um, it's because of the number of times we've started over that it's taken so long. So I feel sure that there is a much better way to do it than what we're currently doing, but nobody is willing to start over again. So we are, we are prisoners to the sunk cost fallacy, I think. All right, I see a lot of people in the back of the room. I don't think they came here to listen to me. So if there are any other questions, nothing? All right, thank you all. <laughs>